Well, with that, um, who has some a soap or two that they've written down and would like to come up and share it? So, Diana, great. I'll let you work with them it's back there. Yeah. First, turn it on. I'm pretty intellectual when it comes to facts, things like that. So I love to read. I don't want to know what somebody knows. I want to read it. So if you're going to tell me something, I better find it in the Bible. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe you. So that's what I really love about soaping. Um, the part that I love is that, um, here's my little book that I soap in. So when I do my soap, scripture, observation, application, and prayer, I title it. So like one is this, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So I can actually go back and go back and look and say, okay, this is what I'm having challenges. Oh, this is what I thought. This is what the Holy Spirit told me. That's what I love about this. And I think that actually helps, will help me in the future when um, I'm witnessing to somebody or something's going on. So instead of trying to be stressed out thinking, oh, what do I need to share with them? I've got something. So I'm actually sharing from Leviticus 13. Um, scripture is 45 and 46. So this it says, for the let me actually read it out. For the leopard who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has an infection. He is alone unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside of the camp. So that's the, the two scriptures. The one thing I learned about Leviticus in this part of 13, you don't want to read this when you're having lunch. <laughs> I did, and I was like, oh, okay, we're, we're not going to do that again. So be, be cautious about what you're reading when you do. So my observation is, and I'm going to read it to you because otherwise I get too wordy. So my observation, the Lord gave Moses and Aaron a procedure for the priests to test and monitor what we're talking about, diseases and so forth and leprosy. So this is those who are infected by a blemish, boil, etc. That's what I said about lunchtime. So this would allow the priest to test and to monitor people infected. The priest made the infected person isolate himself from his family and community because he was unclean and had to live outside of the camp. So this really caught me by surprise. Um, it really brought up a lot of different things I'd shared with a few people. And I actually had to, I've had three different papers that when I've been writing stuff about this. So this is what my, my application was. I realize how the enemy uses our sin to condemn us. He will do everything possible to separate us from God, church, and family. We feel ashamed and unclean. Instead of drawing near, we isolate ourselves. Yet his blood cleanses us. As the priest sacrificed the animal for the person as a sin offering, the priest took the blood and placed it on the person's right earlobe, right thumb, and right big toe. And the other animal was set free. This is what really surprised me and what the Lord showed me. So the Lord was, so this is what I felt the Holy Spirit was really telling me. And it just really caught me, caught me in, in a weird way. It says, the Lord, was, the Lord was sacrificed for our sins. Understand this, for our past our curtain and our future sins. It says his blood was poured out for us when we were set free. So just like with the sacrifice, the, the person brings two animals, one sacrifice, that blood is then put on that person, and then the other one goes free. So with this, the Lord poured out for us, and now we're set free. 
and that to me really made a big difference. Um, so this one scripture in Colossians 2, this made me think of it. Um, when we think about our sins and so forth, it says, and this is Colossians 2, 12 through, I think, 13. Having been buried and buried in him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the work of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together in him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. So, see, he feels really bad. <laughs> so when I talked about our, our past, current, and future sins, scripture right there, he forgives us for all our transitions, transgressions. Not, not what happened last week or what's going to happen tomorrow. Everything. And I think we forget that. I really believe a lot of us forget that. And that's what I'm saying. We separate ourselves. Satan knows that he can grab us. No matter how little the sin is, if we just forget about it, whatever it is, Satan can really use that to um, make us feel bad. And so we may not pray because we feel ashamed. Um, there's so many things that we forget that his blood cleanses us from our head down to our toes. It doesn't matter. He wants us to come to him. So my prayer was this, Lord, help me to remember when I sin that you have paid the price for my sins and to, and to profess them to you. Otherwise, the enemy will use it to separate me from you and those who hold me accountable. So hopefully that helps you guys understand where I got this. Um, I probably sh should have maybe said something about this because this goes along with what the Holy Spirit is telling you, Steve, and others about what's going on with our world and with uh, groups like ISIS, the terrorists, and so forth. Um, I was watching on say, Facebook and they said put a bullet through their eyes and, you know, all these things. I said, yes, <laughs> you know. Um, we are at war. I don't want to deny that or anything, but then last week I started reading um, in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked does not take into account wrong suffering, suffered. And then, as I was reading that, I, the Holy Spirit said, Matthew 5, 44. Luke 6, 27. Luke 6, 35. Love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. So I said, what if all the people who are feeling, this is the body of Christ. This was me. This was part of you. This is our, our body through, the, through Jesus Christ that was persecuted, that, gets, um, that was martyred. And those people that are suffering, this is us. It is only a day away from us, 15 hours by a plane ride to where this is happening. And I, I started to say, Holy Spirit, okay, how do I pray for my enemies? An enemy such as this. And I began to pray. 
and I prayed that Isis's eyes would be opened, the terror's eyes would be opened. And also I prayed for those being martyred and those who were suffering because of it. But I prayed mostly that I do not become angry, I do not become resentful, I do not become angry, you know, I'm, I'm going to go get him because, what does that do? It feeds my enemy, who is Satan. He's doing this. So, I pray, Father, that we know how to pray for our enemies, whether it be ISIS or our neighbor, <laughs> or someone in our own family. Father, I love you so much, and I will do those things that you tell me to do, even though they don't make sense. And I pray also for those people who will go and actually be at war with them. And Father, I thank you for revealing these things to me and opening my eyes. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. So, I also like to, well, Steve told me how to title my soaps and keep a little, uh, what's that called in the beginning? Index. Index. <laughs> so I was able to look back and this one I actually got on November 20, no, 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 on December 2nd. <clears throat> Ephesians 1.13. This is Paul, obviously, and he says, and you, he's talking to the Gentiles, also were included in Christ with the Jews. Uh, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, having believed in the gospel, you were marking him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the seal who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I'm assuming most of you are like me where there's been points in my life that I even kind of questioned my salvation. It was like, man, what's, um, you know, what am I doing right now? Or what did I just do? And, and where am I even at with God? Um, and so this right here maybe is, uh, for, for me, this, this answers that question. Um, what I got out of it is, um, as a believer, I have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I do believe in God, and He has sealed me at that point. Um, this kind of makes me think of a you know, in, in the military, when you get done with training, whatever whatever your specialty training is, um, you know, they have the little ceremony and you walk up and, and the commanding officer shakes your hand and gives you a certificate and he will take a pin, your new insignia, and it's got the little, little needles coming out the back. And those needles are supposed to have the little clasp that clamp it to your cloth. They don't put the clamps on. They just stick that little pin through your shirt, and then you go and stand in line. And uh, after everybody's gone up and shaken his hand, they've all got their new insignias there, their new seal. And um, you're standing in line there. All the instructors who have just had you for, you know, however long it was, two weeks or five years or however long it was, they come along, and uh, they're not supposed to do this, but they do. <laughs> they, they shake your hand and then they punch you right in the insignia so, so it drives those needles right into your chest 
and uh, it's a good kind of pain. <laughs> So um, I guess that's kind of a picture for me that when I believe I'm there, and I look at what he has already done for me. He's already brought me through all these different trials. He's already saved me from this and that. And he's put that seal on me. And, and you know, once, once you have that insignia, you're far from being done with training. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, now you know, so, so I was a seal. Now I am a seal. And the training has really only, only begun. Now I'm a SEAL, now I learn how to be one. Um, I've proven myself, but, but from here on out, the Holy Spirit is going to continue his work. He's got a deposit in me, and he's not letting go. And I can trust him to uh, continue to change me so that I bear fruit for him. I know that's, that's how I can look at my life and, and see where I'm at, is if I'm bearing fruit, um, that fruit only comes through his work in me. So I can, I can trust him to continue, uh, continue that fruit in my life. And that fruit glorifies him. Um, my application is he, the Holy Spirit, has the wheel in my life. Um, he is here to change me and to grow me for his glory. And although it might be uncomfortable at times, I know it is all for good and for my benefit and for his glory. I can relax and trust him to complete his work in me while I praise him because this is what glorifies him. And my prayer is thank you, Jesus. I trust you and welcome the work of the Holy Spirit in me and in my life. Whatever it brings, I know it is for your glory, the love of your children, who I am. <laughs> I didn't want to look like I'm an idiot. Because <laughs> anything you do wrong up here, people talk about when they get in their cars. And how do I know that? <laughs> do, you get the, do you get it? Because <laughs> I talk about all of you guys. <laughs> and then I come to church and repent, and then I'm all good. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I have a believer, yeah. <laughs> so, so I will, I do not mind. I'm serious. It does not bother me at all. Um, so I'm, I'm, my, my scripture S is going to be Matthew 18, where? <clears throat> Matthew 18, 19. Go figure. Okay. I'm gonna put my, my screen on so it won't turn off on me. So my scripture is, it says, um, I wanna start in 18. Um, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. 19, I also tell you this, if two or you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Um, for, where, for wherever two or three are gathered together, and some Bibles say in my name, I will be there with them. So my, um, my observation is this. So I've spoke occasionally in the past, probably a good two years ago, and I, I, would, I would speak. And there was something I, I would usually do. I would play like a song 
or I would make everyone say something to each other, or I would do something where it would cause all of us to do something together. And so a lot of people, they laugh, you know, ha ha, it was funny, and it was meant to be funny, but there was actually a hidden motive in what I was doing. It was actually a strategic move on my part in doing so. The, the, thing, the, thing, the thing about it is, when we all sing, I mean, worship music, right? Worship music is, is the first thing we do when we come to church. It's become the custom. And I think there's a, there's a bad and good thing about that, that it became a custom. Because the reason why we have worship music is not to just sing. It's not to just come and, and get up and, and so you won't be sleepy when someone like me comes and speaks. It's <laughs> the, the reason why we have worship music is because, and the reason why when it's really good to you, the reason why that happens is because you're doing, you're fulfilling and you're doing what the Bible says to do, and when you do the thing the Bible says to do, God promises, is, God, God fulfills his promises. And what is that? When you sing, if two people sing together, what you're saying is, I agree with you, and when you agree with me, then Jesus says, then I'll come sit by you. And so, and so when it's really good to you, that feeling you get, it's not emotion. That feeling you get is the tangible presence of God sitting amongst you because he's saying, I'm fulfilling the promise that I gave to you. If you just agree, if you just agree, I'll do something. And he says, so when you look at this scripture, a lot of people miss it. A lot of people say, well, okay, then my, I'm, I'm, I need to find somebody to pray with so I can get my prayer answered. That's selfish. That's really, I mean, honestly, if, you, if your mind goes there, which my mind went for 30, I'm 35 now. <laughs> if your mind goes there, like my mind always went, 35 years since, it means that you're selfish and how many are selfish with me? Thank you, <laughs> I'm not the only one. Because I, all I thought about was, because I really want this, I need to find somebody so I can manipulate to agree with me so God will give me the thing I want. And yes, I do have an Xbox One, and I agree with my wife, and my wife got me one. Anyway, <laughs> but that's beside the point. <laughs> if you don't know what Xbox One is, I need to pray for you. Anyway, so the thing is, the thing is, so when, when I agree with somebody, it's not to get what I want. It's so that God's will may be done on earth. The first thing God says, he says, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. He says, let us agree. Let us. We are in agreement. Let's make him, let's make man like us. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Do you realize that all this is about is agreement? Do you even realize that the reason why you guys have issues is because you don't even agree with your own self? So God made, God made us, God made us one. But yet there's three parts to us, right? We're mind, body, and spirit. We're mind, body, and spirit. So, my soul, body, and spirit. Do you realize that when you got saved, your spirit became new and alive? And do you know from the moment you got saved, I like what Paul said because he says, when I became a seal, that's when things started to happen. And that's when I actually started training. The moment I got saved, that didn't mean I was changed here. Now I have to agree with the decision I made and then power comes. But I, so I've been a, a horrible Christian my whole life only because I haven't agreed with the decision I made. I, my soul has to agree with my spirit and then Jesus says in verse 19, then I will be in there in the midst of them. But when your spirit and your soul don't agree, you're praying and, and you're, you're fighting against yourself and you're double-minded and you're depressed and you're dealing with this and you're dealing with that because you haven't agreed yet. And that's the problem. And the, and the, the thing that I wanna say to you that you may throw stones at me, but I believe most Christians misunderstand this one truth because do you realize that the principles in this world are principles regardless of whether you believe it or not? Does that make sense? So if I jump off a building, whether I believe gravity exists or not, I'm gonna fall and I'm gonna be that idiot that falls. So when God sets a principle in motion, whether you believe him or not, that principle is in motion. So the Bible says that there's power in agreement so then, whatever I agree with, whether it be a it or a thing, then there's power. So, 
if I agree with the enemy, then there's power. Does that make sense? So I would tell you, and you can believe me if you want, I really don't care, <laughs> but I'll tell you this. 90% of your problems is not because the devil's attacking you, it's because you believed and agreed with him, and now, because you've agreed with him, you've given him your authority to tempt and to mess with you. See, the thing about it is, it's like, okay, so, I, I, I really wanna make this plain. So, Jesus says when he died, all power has been given to me under heaven. All power, what does all mean in the Greek? All, <laughs> exactly. So if all power has been given to me, then he said what? It's, it's yours, it's yours, all power. And then he says, I've taken the keys to the kingdom from the devil, and then he says, I have placed the devil under your feet. Then he says, the devil is like a roaring lion. So the devil has no authority. Who has authority? This is the trick. This is the trick. So the devil, he pretends to be, he pretends to have authority. So, and so what he does, he comes and he says, ah, and he scares you. And then what you do is you believe the scare and you've agreed with him and you've handed the authority God gave to you over to him to tempt you. And now you're in bondage and you're blaming the devil. And it was your fault. It was your fault. And, and, and so when you, when you look at this agreement, you need to understand that the thing you agree with gives you authority. The reason why you have depression, the reason why you're struggling with that thing is because you've, but someone said, believe the lie, believe the delusion. And when you believe the delusion, it gives that thing power. It gives him the power Christ gave you. And that's why the power feels so strong because it is the power Christ gave you, but you gave it away. You've gave it away. The, the enemy has no authority. It's all yours. It's all yours. He who is in me is greater than he is in the world. But if I give me a way that the enemy is messing with me with my own power. Does that make sense? And so my application is, Steve Backlund says this all the time, I need to agree with what the Bible says about me no matter what I feel like or not. It's not about how you feel. My phone. Oh, it's safe. It's safe. <laughs> Ooh, I almost lost it. My phone fell. <laughs> you know how much these things cost? <laughs> Steve Backlund said, I need, to I need to take scripture and I need to agree with the scripture no matter how I feel because the power comes in agreeing with scripture. In agreeing with God, whatever God says about me, that's the truth. So my application is, Lord, help me to see where I have given the devil the authority in my life. Help me, Lord, to see it because I have to, one, confess what I've done, agreement. It's all about agreement. And so my prayer is, and so my, my prayer and application is kind of the same things, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
So that was my observation. The application is that God has a plan for us, so we're supposed to stand and face our troubles. Um, my prayer was that um, God would give us the strength to face what's before us because he does have a plan for us. And in conjunction with that, I had 2 Kings 6, 15 through 17. And it is, um, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots and it has surrounded the city. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So God's the victorious. Rich, isn't this great to hear those touch points where the Holy Spirit has spoken to in people individually through history's bestseller? No other book has ever come close, or will. So this is great. Does anybody else have a scripture, observation, etc., that you've written down that you could share with us? <laughs> While you're dealing with the butterflies, if you do, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just want to. Um, invite you on Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8 at our house just down the road here. We do soap and really the intent here is to help other people get started doing that. I think it's, it's a tool that the Holy Spirit uses and um, so come and we'll do it and we'll share together and You'll, you'll write, bring a, a piece of paper, bring a, a journal, something you can write in. Bring a piece of paper and pen and your Bible, and we'll do that together. So I just, uh, it's something that's, uh, this is my journal here. Others have them. So. Do you have something written down? Oh, it's in your phone? Okay, you got the, the SOAP? I, I did it without knowing what it was this week. Okay, come on, come on up here and share it, yeah. Yeah. I think it's... Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to um, apologize for not being here for a few Sundays. I've been kind of living at the hospital. We had a lot of people out sick, and so I've been covering for everybody and my weekends have been pretty full but I was um, uh, my good old buddy Peggy shared a prophecy with me that I read about um, finding your footing how important it is to find your footing and so I just kept chewing on that through the week and it was on my way to my my office this one morning that the Lord just really spoke to me about finding your footing and what does that mean and that morning he gave me a picture of a very feeble person sitting on their bed and having to stand and it was like every every part of their body had to, to stand so their feet hit the floor and their legs found strength and they just kind of unfolded and stood up and so he was talking to me about finding your footing and I go okay God so I find my footing but what does that mean then so I found my footing and I rose up well what does that mean and so then he gave me the scripture so I think it was kind of backwards well, maybe but but anyway ahead, yeah. so 
So I've been chewing on this all this week, and it's Isaiah 60. Uh, Rise up and shine, for your light has come. The shining greatness of the Lord has risen upon you. For see, darkness will cover the earth, much darkness will cover the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his shining greatness will be seen upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings will see the shining greatness of the Lord on you. Lift up your eyes and look around you and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from far away, and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and shine with joy. And if you have a chance, this is a really long scripture, and it, it I just kept chewing on that over and over and over again because you find your footing and you rise up and the glory of the Lord will shine around you as you represent him in any place you walk whether it's at work or at home and all this stuff that's on the news about ISIS and all these horrific things that are going on in the world you know he's really telling us find your footing rise up and the, and the light of his countenance will shine about, and we are his light that we bring into this world. So that's what he talked to me about this Did week. you have a prayer that went with it? So um, the prayer that I've been praying the rest of this uh, week after he showed that to me is that all of my brothers and sisters will find the light that shines within and that it be reflected around them, that his countenance will cover that. And I prayed over the place where I work and the hallways that I walk, the people that are working there, you know, the soldiers that are coming back uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan, that we as Christians who are serving them, our light is shining because God, what God has done in our life. And so that, that's what I prayed throughout okay. the week. So, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. What all of you shared is just very, very good. It's a real privilege to listen, hear, know, to see the Holy Spirit using uh, his book to mentor each one of you. So get it open this week. Five, six times. Do it. You won't regret it. Um, I want to read a chapter. And I'm not going to make very many comments, but it's Matthew 24. And uh, it's given some of the things that we've talked about this morning. And um, it's towards the end of Jesus' ministry. Uh, his disciples came asking him some questions. And uh, just note as we go through here that Jesus has some categories of indicators of his return and uh, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna preach I'm just gonna read um, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives this is beginning chapter 3 or chapter 24 of Matthew and beginning in verse 3 the disciples came to him privately say, saying tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. That was the question. What's the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The second return of Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to them, I don't have anything to say. Look at your Bibles. Is that what it says? You're looking at me. Look at your Bibles. That isn't what he said. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to them oh, pay attention to this phrase right here take heed that no one deceives you that's how he introduces this whole topic hmm you're going to see this come up several times here he's going to repeat it take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will deceive many 
and you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Ooh, that's among Christians. Hmm. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. There's that word again. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Oh Lord, don't let our, our love grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Another word for nations is tribes. When I was in my 20s, Wycliffe Bible Translators and the U.S. Center for World Missions estimated that there were 30,000 languages that had no testimony of Christ or had no written scripture in them. That number now is in the low thousands. Wow, things have really changed. Hmm. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all tribes and then the end will come. Is it any surprise that we're seeing some of what we're seeing? <clears throat> Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. And I'm not sure that I know what that means. But you know what? The Holy Spirit can help us. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let, those, let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant and those with nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless these days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, even as to deceive, there's that word again, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out, or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. You know what? Lightning is really obvious. It flashes all across the sky. Nobody can mistake it. That's the way the return of Jesus is going to be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Interesting, talking about what's happening in the heavens. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven, of the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. He's coming back, brothers and sisters. And yes, we pray, and we disciple, and we do what we've been called to do, and we obey, and we vote, and we write our congressmen, we don't isolate, we engage, we give grace to our society and our culture. And like our brothers, brothers who were martyred, the last thing that was on their lips was Jesus. Amen. And um, what a testimony, what a reminder to us of what matters. And he's coming again. And uh, we're the great hope. We're the bright spot on earth. And we're the ones that have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We have the presence of heaven to give away. And that's our, that's our testimony. That's, 
That's who we are. As we see these things on television and the things that are happening, just be reminded, Jesus said there's going to be signs and indicators of, of his return. And we're seeing some of those things. And uh, he, he's coming for us. And hallelujah. Uh, I just wanted to close with that hope and reminder and be, um, be a person of the book and keyed into the Holy Spirit and Thank you for all of you that shared um, what the Holy Spirit had placed on your heart this morning, the soaps that you've shared. It's been great. And I encourage um, others, just nudging, do it. You'll never regret it. Um, you will meet uh, Jesus in ways that you never have before. So, and that's what it's all about anyway. So, well, let's stand together. Now I'm going to put his name on all of you. And you could do it this way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his very countenance. May you see his face. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Blessing is going to go upon you. And his name is upon you in the unseen realm. Hallelujah. Go in peace and be an influence for him. Amen? Amen. Have a great week.